that traveling kilt from Nova Scotia is amazing. In the last video, we visited Cape Breton Island. Today, we are going to look at the northern mainland of Nova Scotia. Today, we are traveling over the Canso Causeway and we'll look at a couple of different scenic routes to enjoy mainland Nova Scotia. First, let's follow the Atlantic coast, known as the Marine Drive. The coastal beauty has long served as a destination for visitors from around the world. I enjoy exploring the inlets and the islands. You can see nesting seabirds, seals, remnants of early fishing settlements, and to see where hundreds, if not thousands of shipwrecks have taken place. You will begin in Mulgrave, on the Strait of Canso. Founded in 1605, it is one of the oldest settlements in Nova Scotia. You will follow the coast to the town of Canso where French fishermen began using the offshore island as a fishing camp in the early 1600s because it was very close to a lucrative fishing ground and could easily be defended. These fishermen prospered and developed a full-scale fishing settlement. In the early 1700s, the French were forced out by New Englanders who flocked to take part in the rich fisheries. Today, Canso is home to the Stan Rogers Folk Festival. Held in early July, the festival is a mix of traditional Celtic music, country, blues, rock, bluegrass, and folk music. Thousands attend every year. Further along you'll find Torbay Provincial Park, which opens up to the Atlantic Ocean with a mixture of sandy beaches, fragile sand dunes, and rugged offshore rock formations. It was here, in 1875, the first direct commercial cable was used to successfully transmit messages from England to mainland North America. As you marvel at the rugged coastline, you'll pass through a number of small picturesque towns, many of them of Acadian origin. Sherbrooke Village is definitely worth the stop. It is the largest Nova Scotia museum site. It depicts a typical Nova Scotian village from the 1860s to pre-World War I. There are approximately 80 buildings, with 25 of them open to the public, most with costumed interpreters. The town was originally built on the economy of shipbuilding, lumbering, and gold mining, and I'll talk more about that. Sherbrooke Village reflects Nova Scotia as it was during the industrial boom. Further down the road is the district of Tangier, the location of Nova Scotia's first gold mines, first discovered in 1858 at Mooseland on the Tangier River. At the same time activities began in Tangier, gold was discovered in various other areas in Nova Scotia. During its heyday, the golden age of gold mining in Nova Scotia was between 1885 and 1903, with the 1890s being the most productive. 243,699 ounces of gold were produced during that decade. And if you are wondering what that would be worth in today's market, where gold is valued just over $1,664 an ounce, it would have fetched you a whopping $405,515,136, approximately. Now I know the golden age of gold mining has long passed, but it might be worth taking a weekend or two just to poke around. I'll let you know if I find anything. If you do find yourself in Tangier, looking for gold, or just enjoying the scenery, and you like smoked salmon, mackerel, or eels, then it's worth a visit to J. Willie Krelkinson's. They have been smoking fish since 1956 in their traditional Scandinavian style smokehouse. It is very tasty. If you're traveling this route in August and stop at Clam Harbor, go to the beach and see if you find the annual Clam Harbor Beach Sand Castle Sculpture Contest. You'll know if it's happening. There'll be thousands of sightseers, scores of sand artists, enormous castles, dragons, and other amazing designs. If you miss that particular weekend, don't be disappointed. Enjoy the beach. And look for surfers. That's right, surfers. You'll find that many Atlantic Coast beaches have surfers almost all year round. Yes, the water is cold, but you'll see, even in the middle of the summer, these surfers will be wearing wetsuits. I told you that Sherbrooke Village is one of the largest museums in Nova Scotia. Well, at Jador Oyster Pond, you will find one of Nova Scotia's smallest and yet most fascinating provincial museums. The tiny house and farm is known as the Fisherman's Life Museum and once was the home to a turn-of-the-century inshore fisherman, his wife, and their 13 daughters. 
The staff there are amazing and love to share the family stories. A few kilometers from Muscadabit Harbor is Martinique Beach, the longest sand beach in Nova Scotia, and it's a bird sanctuary. The beach itself is a protected nesting area for the piping plover, an endangered species. From here you're only a few miles from Halifax Regional Municipality, but we're not going to go there yet. Instead, we're going to backtrack and give you another option to explore mainland Nova Scotia from Cape Breton, the Sunrise Trail. This time, after you cross over the causeway, you'll stay on the Trans-Canada Highway and head towards the town of Antigonish. Now don't let the idea of traveling on the highway bother you. It is not like an interstate highway in the United States or the Audubon in Germany. Here traffic moves comfortably, at a very relaxed pace, and most of the time it is just you and a few other vehicles on the road. You will be able to take this time to enjoy the scenery. Look at the coves and the bays along the Northumberland Strait, or the view out to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Take a glimpse to the meadows and the fields where you might see a deer taking a drink. I'd mentioned in an earlier podcast it's very important to relax when visiting Atlantic Canada. Leave your stresses behind and enjoy everything that is around you. You will pass by the community of Monastery, named for the French Trappist Monastery of La Trappe, France. This Nova Scotia monastery was opened here in 1825 and was closed in 1919 but reopened again in 1938 under the St. Augustine Fathers who came to this country to escape Nazi persecution. The monastery is not open to the public, but there is a public outdoor chapel in the Glen that features the natural spring. Not far off the highway is the village of Ponket, settled in 1761 by the Acadians six years after the Acadian expulsion. Today many homes proudly fly the Stella Maris, the Acadian flag, which looks like the flag of France, with a gold star. Antigonish holds a special spot for me. It has a very strong Scottish heritage, and is home to lots of my relatives. It is also the birthplace of my dad. It is here the largest and oldest Highland Games held outside of Scotland takes place. The Antigonish Highland Games have been held here every year since 1861. To continue along the Sunrise Trail, follow the shore of the St. George's Bay. Some argue this is one of the most scenic drives in Nova Scotia. Watch for the turn that leads to the Cape George Lighthouse, standing high on a bluff, about 300 meters or a thousand feet above the flow of the tide. A lighthouse has stood here since 1895. The present lighthouse was built in 1968. On clear days, you can see Prince Edward Island, over 50 kilometers or 30 miles away. A short drive down the road is the Arizak Provincial Park, where you can stop and stroll along the shoreline and see fossils millions of years old in the sedimentary rock. This route brings you back to the communities of New Glasgow, Stellarton, and Trenton, where coal was first discovered in 1798 and mined up until just recently. A short drive back on the Trans-Canada Highway will bring you to the exit to Picto and the Prince Edward Island Ferry Terminal. The historic town of Picto, one of the largest communities on the Northumberland shore, is a popular destination for visitors. The town dates back to September 15, 1773, when Nova Scotia's first boatload of Scottish Highlanders, where 33 families and 25 unmarried men, sailed the Atlantic Ocean for two and a half months on the ship Hector. This was the beginning of the wave of Scottish migration that has had such a major impact on the development of this province. You can use your imagination on what it might have been like to sail across the Atlantic Ocean when visiting the Pictou waterfront and touring the full-scale replica of the ship built there at the Hector Heritage Quay. A few miles from the town is the ferry terminal to Prince Edward Island. There is still more to see and do in Nova Scotia. For example, the Creamery Square on the waterfront in the historic town of Tatamagouche. Creamery Square houses amazing exhibits including 290 million year old fossils from the Brule Fossil Collection. Then on to Pugwash, a charming village located on a scenic harbor at the mouth of the Pugwash River. 
Now, Pugwash gained world attention in 1957 when millionaire industrialist and humanitarian Cyrus Eaton convented the first Thinkers Conference. The Pugwash movement became synonymous with themes of global cooperation and nuclear disarmament. The Pugwash Conferences and their chairman, Joseph Rotblat, were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1995. Next is Oxford, known as the Blueberry Capital of Canada. The Oxford region produces over half of Canada's total blueberry harvest each year. This trail ends at the historic streets of Amherst. Graced with charming Victorian and Edwardian architecture, Amherst was remarkably the home to four of the original 36 fathers of Canadian Confederation. As the Sunrise Trail ends, so does today's podcast, but not our travels through Nova Scotia. If you have any questions or comments about Nova Scotia, let us know. You can do this by joining us on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash NS is amazing, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Nova Scotia is amazing, and Instagram at instagram.com forward slash Nova Scotia is amazing. Also, make sure to visit us at novascotiaisamazing.com and sign up for the list of 21 amazing things to do in Nova Scotia, as well as other tips, ideas, and special offers that we will be sharing. And oh yes, subscribe to this YouTube channel. In the next video, we are going to take a look at the southern part of mainland Nova Scotia. Until then, have a fun day.